From Chicago's Can TV, this is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there, and welcome to Chicago Newsroom for another conversation about the city that we like to just sit around and yak about here on Can TV. I'm Ken Davis. Well, we're 34 days away from Chicago's municipal election as we sit here on this morning of January 24th, the Thursday. And we finally have the other critical number. It's 14. That's how many candidates for mayor will apparently be on the ballot this time around. And remember, early voting is going to begin in just a few days as soon as they can get those ballots printed, I guess. So how do 14 candidates get themselves heard in such a short time, especially if they're not tapped into millions and millions of dollars from unions and big time bankrollers? It's something we've been concerned about for a long time here at Chicago Newsroom, and it's the reason why we committed months ago to inviting the candidates in for one-on-one -on -one conversations about their candidacies. No lightning rounds of yes, no answers, no one-minute responses to questions like, how will you solve Chicago's gun violence problem? And we're very happy to say that just about all the candidates have taken us up on it. So far, only one has refused our offer, and that's only because of scheduling issues. So today, we're welcoming Illinois State Representative LaShawn Ford. He represents the 8th District, which includes quite a bit of Chicago's West Side, and he's been in the legislature since 2007. He announced his candidacy for mayor in late September, a couple weeks after Mayor Emanuel announced that he wasn't running for re-election. And it's a great pleasure to have you here at the table. We haven't had you on the show before, so welcome to Chicago Newsroom. Thank you, Ken, and I'm very happy to be here. And I want to thank Can TV Public Access for making this possible. Oh, thank you. And, and definitely, I mean, you personally worked the room and, and invited me personally, so I really <laughs> appreciate that. Well, you know, it, it, it's, it's one of these things that's really interesting about this is that uh, as, as we get closer to the election, the ones we haven't had a chance to get are getting harder and harder to get yeah. because it's harder to get on their schedules. And, and to be fair, you didn't, it wasn't like a, you, you were endorsing me, but you like, no. let me make sure we get everyone oh, yeah, yeah. And, so I and appreciate that. So that's what we're doing now. We're going to these public events and just kind of buttonholing the yeah. last folks and saying, we need to get you on. Anyway, um, I, I want to ask you a question. I, I have this weird obsession with maps, and I was looking at your district today, and I knew it was kind of an odd-shaped district, but until I really got down to it, I, it's like you start on central, how far north in the city? What's your northern? So the like? northernmost will hit down at Bloomingdale. Okay, down so toward yeah, and, all right. Yeah, so so just north there. of North Avenue. Right. And then if you, if you had a map of the city and the suburbs and you put that pin at like north and central, you'd go all the way down into like Brookfield practically, Exactly, right? even further to um, Western Springs. Western to the Springs. point of Western Springs. Yeah. So, so you got this little narrow alley of a, of a district. It's, yeah. it's, it, it's prepared me to represent the diversity of Chicago. Yeah, I'll say. You know? Uh, it's been great to represent that district, you know, yeah. the west side of Chicago, um, Oak Park, uh -huh. Berwyn. A little bit of Oak Park and Yeah, Berwyn. South yeah. Oak Park, yeah. Berwyn, LaGrange, uh -huh. LaGrange Park, all of North Riverside, uh -huh. um, parts of Western Springs, Brookfield, Proviso. So it's a microcosm of city. That's got to be one of the most diverse wards in probably the whole legislature, I would bet. You know, it is very, very diverse, and it is um, close to being a non-minority um, district. Um, Is it really? Yes, yeah. and yeah. a lot of the uh, districts are sort of gerrymandered to be mm -hmm. um, close to, uh, closely aligned with its member. Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. Um, and you got a lot of industrial land in there and stuff, so it, it's kind of, it, it's also diverse in terms of like the housing stock and everything else, right? So, it is, you, yeah. you have the diversity of people that have high property taxes. Mm -hmm. We have a, a diversity of um, communities that have great school districts. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. have a diversity of communities with um, low unemployment and high unemployment yeah, yeah, and yeah, crime yeah. and poverty. Yeah. yeah. So the kind of calls that come into your office are, <laughs> they're, they must run the gamut. It, so, yes. Yeah. You, you know, you, yeah. have, you have people that call because they need social services and mm -hmm. you have people that's interested in environmental issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's what I've been able to. Yeah. Um, do you like it? Do you enjoy it? I do. I enjoy yeah. it. Especially I enjoy it most when people are involved mm -hmm. and they call the office with the will to help get the job done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And as I said, you've doing, been doing this since 2007. So um, 
you made some decision somewhere along the line that uh, you needed to step up and become our mayor. So what was the thinking there? What was the process? How did you, how did you arrive at that decision? Well, I had never, Ken, um, thought of running for mayor of the city of Chicago until the grassroots community came and said, you're running for mayor, mm -hmm. we want you to consider it. And so that was a group of diverse um, people from the city of Chicago from many different communities um, which helped us get over 40,000 signatures to be on the ballot. You know, we had people from the immigration community. Uh, we had people from the gay and lesbian, LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. We had people from the reentry communities all coming together saying, we need you to run for mayor mm -hmm. of Chicago. Of mm -hmm. course, that came after the um, announcement of, of um, the current mayor, yeah. Rahm Emanuel, yeah. but they said, you know what? You have stood up against the machine politics. Mm -hmm. You called for the recall of Rahm. And we think that with you being um, one that, that stands up against the machine, we, we, we support you. And they got over 40,000 signatures. And you know, I gotta say that I, I will tell you honestly, that, that came as a surprise to me because you know, it looked like <laughs> maybe a couple of months ago, it looked like things were kind of you know, jowling. You gotta see where things were going. And then suddenly you come out of nowhere with 40,000 signatures. And yeah. you and, uh, and uh, Amara Enya too, both, yeah. both very, I mean, may I say, surprising to, yeah. to, that you got these large numbers very quickly. Yeah. So that, that's because when you have the community, the grassroots um, mm -hmm. folks saying that they want to get involved, mm -hmm. that's what you get. I yeah. mean, yeah. Um, when you look at people like um, Suzanne Mendoza, you look at Tony Pretwinkle, you look at the dailies, those are machine yeah. politicians. Yeah. Yeah. And you know who they get to get their signatures? They get people that they have gotten jobs, taxpayer mm -hmm. jobs. So they have to go off the clock and get signatures. We didn't have that um, type mm -hmm. of engagement in our campaign. Mm -hmm. So tell me, it's a kind of a dumb question in a way, but I think it's something that people think is like, how are you different from Rahm Emanuel? What, what, something about Rahm Emanuel made you want to be, to take this leap, right? You know what, I think the city and the people made me want to take the leap mm -hmm. because, but what we know about Rahm Emanuel's focus, mm -hmm. You know, he clearly is a corporate type of um, leader. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you can't have that type of governing in the city of Chicago. The city of Chicago is made up of 77 communities yeah. of diversity, and each community has its different needs. Mm -hmm. I don't think that Rahm has the will and the um, desire to represent all communities because his focus has always been his relationships with corporate America. And so does that make him a bad person? Well, it doesn't make him a bad person, but what it does um, tell us is that it's been bad for the city of Chicago. And what we need is a mayor that understands that we have to take a step back and reset Chicago politics and make sure that we destroy the, the normal um, machine politics in Chicago, destroy the cronyism in the city of Chicago, where only a few people have access to our 600 plus billion dollar economy. Mm -hmm. You know, Rahm is focused on making sure that he has great relationships with Google, that he has great relationships with Boeing, that he has great relationships with all of the billion dollar industry. So for that, I thank him for bringing some of those industries here so that now we could tap those industries to help deal with some of the problems in mm -hmm. the inner city, yeah. like the south and west sides of Chicago. Which wards, which Chicago wards does your legislative district touch? We have the 28, 29, and 37 oh, wards. Okay. All right, so these are, these are wards that have some financial stress. Yeah, you see vacant and abandoned properties, yeah. high unemployment, yeah. and high poverty. So when, when people say, Rahm is the downtown mayor and that he's been ignoring a lot of communities. You're representing part of that yeah. so-called ignored part of the city. Without a doubt. I mean, the ignoring of the south and west sides of Chicago, ignoring the parts of the west side that was hit in the 1968 riots, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, we should have had TIF dollars come into those areas to develop those areas to mm -hmm. eliminate the blight. And because of that, we, we continue to see crime in those areas um, on the west side, like Austin. Mm -hmm. We continue to see trauma um, festering in people's lives because, you know, there seems to be hopelessness in families because of the stress of their neighborhoods. And you think that one person, a, a good person becoming mayor, could begin to turn that 40, 50, 60 years of blight around? Without a doubt. I think that it takes a mayor that's going to have a restorative justice, a moral compass, and the will to heal the city. You know, you have a choice. You're going to either cater to big businesses, or you're going to make big businesses pay their fair share and cater to working families, working men and women and children, making sure that families have a real pathway to success, making sure that families have the ability to send their kids to high quality early education. The impression that so many of us have is that, um, you know, the guys who run LaSalle Street and the guys who run three or four of the major corporations in Chicago and the developers like Sterling Bay, these are the people who essentially I would use the term own the city. They, they own and run Chicago. The mayor doesn't really run the city. It's run by a lot of very powerful people who really control the finances of the city. And the mayor has only so much that the mayor can do. And that at some point, uh, if you start talking about all of this restorative justice yeah. stuff, they're gonna say, yeah, that, that's nice. We'll, we'll get to that later. But first of all, we gotta finish you know, Lincoln Yards, right? These are the things that really count. These things really matter. How would you be able to stand up to that and say, no, we're going we're gonna to change the priorities? That's exactly right. You just simply say that we're changing the priorities. Do you have the power you have, to do you have that? The, power. the mayor has the moral obligation to present a budget for the city of Chicago that protects its people. Mm -hmm. So the mayor has to bring the people to um, the table and say, look, we have to be partners. Private and government have to work together for the common good. And if we do that, if you have a mayor that truly believes that, I believe that the um, business community, I think they want to help. I think they want to help. They just have not been giving the push and an ask to do it. Hmm. Most corporations donate to nonprofits, mm -hmm. but they don't know the inner city communities. So when you have a moral leader, that's going to introduce them to the communities that need their help the most, it only benefits their corporations. I mean, business people like good public um, press. So we could give them that when they become um, contributors to our society and, and pay their fair share. I mean, when you have a mayor that allows for big businesses to dodge um, the taxes mm -hmm. that they should be paying, that hurts communities. It hurts small communities. When you have a mayor that allows the big bu bu buildings downtown to avoid paying their fair share of property taxes, that is passed on to neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And because of that, people in Streeterville, people in Lincoln Park, people all over the city, they're paying the price for the cronyism and the corruption in and Chicago politics. And they seem politics. to be beginning to figure that out. Yes. But, uh, one of the things that, that, there's really two things that you're touching on here. First of all, the whole thing about TIFs, which we, we absolutely will have to talk about. Yeah. Um, when, when money is siphoned away to be put into a TIF fund, then the schools and the police, it, it's commonly said, that the money is taken away from schools, but it isn't really taken away from schools because schools uh, make their own tax levy and they get what they ask for. But the problem is that if not all the money that would normally have gone there goes there, then we as taxpayers have to kick in a little bit Extra. more to, to make that work. So there's that. And, and people who are living in expensive housing are beginning to figure that out. I think mm -hmm. it's taken a while for that to happen. But then you also have, as what we've been seeing with Ed Burke and, and, and others, he's not the only one, that the politicians who 
pass the tax levies and then with their other hat help the big buildings downtown to cut their own taxes when every time they take a million dollars off the table then we have to kick a million bucks into we homeowners that's right right so you've got these kind of twin uh, forces that are working against the individual taxpayer but again can you begin to change that? Can you, can you make the city council change that? That's the real question. You know, it starts not just with the city council, but it also starts with Springfield, making sure that you have a legislator in Springfield or a mayor that understands the process of Springfield. Out of all of the candidates for mayor of the city of Chicago, I'm the only candidate in this race with the relationships in Springfield with the conversations that I've had with the members in Springfield, having a relationship with the Chicago delegation mm -hmm. uh, in Springfield, it's clear we're ready to make sure that we change the way the system operates for um, communities. To make sure that um, the um, big buildings downtown pay their fair share. So mm -hmm. yes, we can do it and I think that what we have to show the big businesses is, I mean, you're gonna pay property taxes. Why hurt the small communities? Yeah, yeah. Because guess what? It's a tax write-off for them. It's still a tax write-off. You pay your taxes, mm -hmm. you give that money that you pay to the, uh, that you pay for your taxes to your accountant, and it's a tax write-off. Yeah. You know, this is, this is a really interesting conversation to me because there are so many of these things that are just mysterious to me. I, one of Chicago's most intractable problems, and I'm not going to say gun violence, one of its most intractable problems is its absolute inability to build housing that is affordable for people who want to live here. Yeah. And I, I happen to believe that these things are also interwoven, that if you, could, if you could tackle the housing problem, you would begin to tackle the gun violence problem, because if people had decent places to live and could build communities around them, then you wouldn't have the kind of hopelessness that yes. we have. But that aside, how do you do it? How do you get, how do you get the money that's required to, or, or, or get the investors you would need to come in and start saying, hey, I could actually make money building houses for people who don't have a lot of money. It wouldn't be as much as if I built a 60-story tower down on Michigan Avenue, but I could make a living doing this. And I've never figured out why it doesn't happen. Well, you see development in every community, but the communities that need it. So we can have affordable housing in the city by eliminating the vacant and abandoned buildings, eliminating the uh, vacant lots, and we have to have relationships with small developers, people in the community to do that. Secondly, we have the CHA. CHA is a department, an agency under the mayor's mm -hmm. um, control. Mm -hmm. It's a $1.6 plus billion dollar budget. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're supposed to do everything that we can to um, eliminate um, um, homelessness and to make affordable housing. Yeah. But once again, you have to have a mayor that understands and have the will to do it. Right now, the mayor is a mayor that really wants to gentrify Chicago because mm -hmm. when you have someone like Rahm Emanuel and um, a daily, you have people that clearly have friends in high places. And so who are they gonna cater to? They cater to their friends and cronies. So you have to have a common person that lives in the community, that lives in a small bungalow apart, um, house on the west side of Chicago that understands the struggles of uh, working families. I mean, there's no understanding that a Bill Daly could have about Chicago's 77 communities. He's clearly a person that is well connected with big corporations in America. That's why he had Howard Dean come out. What good is a Howard Dean coming to Chicago to get into a Chicago mayoral election? That tells you where his focus is. Mm -hmm. I still want to stay with this though because I I think you're I, I, I think you're someone who, who deals with this on a daily basis and, and I've never been able to get to this. Why don't we have more um, it's always it's kind of a catch all phrase, affordable housing, but why don't we have developers who are coming in, and I, I get your mm -hmm, CHA thing, mm -hmm, that's a separate mm -hmm. conversation, but why don't we have private developers who are coming in and saying 
if you'll let me take, you know, these four blocks, I will build a small community. Thank you that for block. that. Thank you. Why can't that happen? You know, Ken, that's very good. I'm glad you stayed on it because what you have is a city that's not friendly to small developers. It's so very difficult to get permits in the city of Chicago. It's corrupted in the permits department and the zoning department. And we have to make sure that we eliminate that corruption. We know now the zoning person it has been under investigation for a very long time. So you have people that... I'm talking it, about Danny Solis. Danny Solis. So you have people that, that struggle as developers that want to help develop um, these blighted communities, but because they don't want to pay to play, hmm. they run away from development. So Do you know this? Have you, have you experienced this? I've experienced people saying that Chicago's politics and to do development in the city is so difficult and so corrupted and if you can't pay you're not going to have opportunities you know pat o'connor's wife is a um, real estate person she gets lots of business those people are well connected mm -hmm. pat o'connor a powerful all of it now the chair of the finance um, committee development happens in those areas mm -hmm. those people have access and connections his wife realtor gets the um, sale of those properties so when we tear down the corruption in the city of Chicago zoning and finance committee, we're going to begin to see people wanting to do business with the city of Chicago. Secondly, Chicago and Illinois have um, more charter banks than most. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make sure that our banks and our credit unions become friendly and partners in these communities, you know, they have CRAs that they have to fulfill mm -hmm. and they want a great CRA rating. Mm -hmm. And so most banks have investments in these blighted communities. They need to know that when they invest in these communities where they have investments, that it only helps the homeowners in that area. Okay, so, so again, I'll ask the same question again. Why? Why won't banks do this? They can make money. They won't make, again, they won't make quite as much money as if they bankroll a, you know, 60-story building. But they'll make money. They won't and do it. And it will be, it'll be stable money for a long time. You know why they won't why? do it? Because they will in certain communities. We know that black people and brown people struggle to get loans. But that happens because the city of Chicago, they're not doing their part to make sure these communities are valuable, mm -hmm. making sure that the banks know that this is a great place to invest in because we're gonna be your partner. Mm -hmm. We're gonna make sure that the streets are clean. We're gonna make sure that the streets are safe. We're gonna make sure that you're gonna have customers that's gonna come in these communities because the education is good. Mm -hmm. So banks are not going to invest their money in communities where you have failing school systems. Mm -hmm. Banks are not gonna invest their money where you have a, um, a high crime and in those areas. Banks are not gonna invest their money in communities where the unemployment is high. So the city of Chicago has been an enemy to the people and to the community. So when you see vibrant communities, you see that, because banks say, I have confidence in this community. Mm -hmm. The city values these communities, yeah. so I can too. Mm -hmm. So when we value our communities, we will have the support of banks and credit unions to invest in those neighborhoods. We had a very interesting conversation at this table a few weeks ago with Daniel K. Hertz, who has written a book called uh, The Battle of Lincoln Park, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I, I just can't recommend the book highly enough because it is such an interesting intense study on racial politics and how the the the, the sort of the uh, the firing line that happens right at, at, in this case at you know north and wells where where one street becomes the 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 battle line between black and white and and you're willing to tear an entire 10 block area down just to prevent you know all that stuff but part of the, the, the reason for bringing that up is that this thing that we were just talking about, about getting people to invest, getting people to believe that something can work. And there's, there's this whole, it's something that I think a mayor could do if a mayor wanted to, but you have to sort of ignite that flame somehow. That's you have right. to say, look at this area here, this, well, actually, what I was going to start, what I was bringing up was that, that he, he talks extensively about 
the role that FDR plays in all yes. of this with, with his housing department coming into all the major cities of the country and drawing the red lines. So yeah. We talk about somebody being redlined. That was literally the case, that maps were drawn with red lines saying this community we're not investing in. Right. Right, so we have this we have this racist history that that has been with us since the since World War II. Well, I mean, obviously before, before, but I mean, yeah. in this case, <laughs> in this particular case, that we still haven't gotten out from underneath. We still haven't gotten underneath, uh, gotten out from redlining and the and the effects that it had on minority families. You know, it, you're absolutely right, and you have to have a moral leader that's willing to have those serious conversations. And Dr. King said, racial understanding is not something that we find, but it's something that you create. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a mayor that's willing to create that understanding in the city of Chicago. Mm -hmm. You know, white people sometimes get a, 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 a bad break because people will look at whites and say that they're all racist and mm -hmm. they don't want to have the conversation about race. Mm -hmm. But you got to have a moral leader that's willing to have that conversation so that we can begin to understand um, racism and that we can join in together to fight the racism in Chicago so that we can begin to work together uh, regardless to what race, regardless to what community we're in to fight against the police um, racism mm -hmm. in the department, that we could fight against the racism in the Chicago public schools, that we could fight against the racism in the housing, against the segregation in communities. That's what you have to have. The city needs a leader that's willing to have that discussion and lead this city into a healing state. And to be able to do that without I don't know, threatening the status quo or right. something. I don't exactly know how to say this, but but we we have just separated ourselves into these two camps. We're doing it on the national level with Trump. We're doing it we're doing it in in economics. We're doing it in so many ways. We're just kind of like segregating ourselves into into uh intellectual buckets. Yeah. And this is this is the thing that you got to have that conversation, but you got to have well, minority and non-minority, however you want to put it, you got to have all these people engaged in the conversation at the same time. And respectful. And respectful. Yeah. And in a respectful yeah. way. And the sense I've had of the last few years has been that uh, you have you have people in power who are talking to the money people That's in power right. and saying, listen, do me a favor, would you? Would you put a store that's in exactly down there? That's exactly right. You know, can, can, I know it's it's going to be a Whole Foods. It's going to be kind of hard for you to do, but would you do it yeah. for me? Because, you know, we got to try to, you know, and it's not the, it's not the same thing as saying how can we sit down and figure out ways that we can kickstart this community, that we can make this community begin, pretty much begin over again. Yeah. I mean, I can't afford Whole Food. <laughs> I mean, and, and Whole Food is, yeah. is not affordable for working yeah. families, yeah. you know, and so to do that in the community is deceiving. And mm -hmm. like you said, it was just, you see the power that the mayor could have with the business community. Mm -hmm. He said, why don't you just put this Whole Food in there? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're right. Um, Ken, why not have a relationship with the owners of Whole Food and say, look, let's visit this community and figure out how we can make sure that we build. They're only the biggest corporation right. in the, on the planet. Right. So yeah. that's the relationship we need, not mm -hmm. a business opportunity for them, mm -hmm. but a relationship that they understand mm -hmm. the needs of the community. Yeah, it's interesting to me that you know I, I was recently in New Orleans and and you see what's going on in the Lower Ninth where where everything was just wiped yeah. out. I'm not sure I think this is good, but at least because there was a tragedy of such high proportions, there's money coming in to begin to rebuild it. And yet, what we have, and this gets into the gun violence thing. I've said this a hundred times on here. If somebody, if somebody, shot 800 people in Chicago this afternoon somehow mm -hmm. it would it would it would be historic and we'd be talking about it for 50 years right? right but if we do it one or two at a time over a year it doesn't get it just doesn't get the play we we, we just learn to live with it somehow yeah. and it's the same thing with this with this housing issue and all of this economic uh, development thing that 
it's a slow tragedy. It's been going on for 50, 60 years. We hardly notice it. But if, if a natural disaster came in and wiped out a third of Chicago, we'd be busily going about rebuilding it. Yeah, but you know, it's slow, but it's also taxing on our mind. Yeah. You see more people in need of, of mental and behavioral health treatment. We see more people using um, substance, mm -hmm. having a substance um, use disorder. That's a sign of a city that needs healing. We mm -hmm. have people that sleeping on the streets of Chicago. That's because we have a problem with affordable housing, but we also have a strong mental yeah. health problem in this city. We have people that's being arrested because they are mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we have our police departments that's not equipped with helping people with behavioral health problems. Mm -hmm. So we've shifted their problems off to other social agencies, the schools and the police yeah. and, and everything else. Um, I, you grew up in public housing. I was born in public housing and stayed there for two years Where? in Cabrini. Oh, Cabrini. Oh, you yes. were born in Cabrini. I was born in Cabrini wow. and um, my mother was 15 when she had me and um, I never met my father. I still mm -hmm. don't know who he is today. Mm -hmm. um, my grandmother adopted me at birth. so. Um, I had the honor of being raised by my grandmother, wow. and, um, and I still have a great relationship with my mother that's um, struggling with substance use uh -huh. disorder, heroin addiction. And so that's how and why I know that we're at a point in the city of Chicago and in this country that we have a, a, a way to help people. So this, this housing issue is just stitched right into you from birth. It's stitched in me from birth. I know real estate, and I know and you were a real estate I'm, I'm still a real estate broker mm -hmm. and I, I started my own company. It's the first in the family. I'm the first in my family to um, graduate from college, the Excellent. first in my family to start my own business, the first in my family to um, get into politics. And win. And win. I've <laughs> defeated the machine. And that's what we're going to do with, um, with this uh, campaign. We're mm -hmm. going to defeat the machine and we're going to um, kill off the machine. I think um, Harold said that patriotism is dead. And he went Not to the- patriotism, patronage. A, a, a patronage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Re, rewind that and, and cut that out, right. <laughs> Let the record show. <laughs> right, and he went to the grave and he, um, right. You know, he, we didn't want to kill a patron. Yeah, right. <laughs> and he went to the grave, but now we have to get rid of the machine politics because yeah, the yeah. machine politics has corrupted Chicago and it costs people um, in every community. And, you know, some people in Lincoln Park or Streeterville may not know, but you said it earlier, I think they're beginning to know mm -hmm. that the ordinary way of Chicago politics they're is not just a special hurting. tax. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, and actually, it's, it's interesting because the rich and the powerful are the ones who are paying that special tax. Right. They just didn't really think about yes. it very much. You know, I was just thinking maybe, uh, maybe this whole thing about rebuilding the West Side, if you guys, who are, you know, political leaders mm -hmm. out on the West Side. If you had just uh, hired Ed Burke's firm to do your tax uh, stuff, <laughs> you might be doing very well today. You know, I, I tell you, he, he um, got tax breaks for only the rich and famous, oh. you know, like oh, Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah, I don't I think we had access to his um, resources, you I know. See. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wanted, I, I think this might be as good a time as any to pivot off onto uh, policing and, and how we should be doing policing, but I, I also just want to just take a minute to, to sort of attach to this whole discussion about uh, housing, the issue of gentrification, mm -hmm. because in a way they kind of go hand in glove, don't they? I mean, oh, yeah. it, it, the, gentrification is a major problem in Chicago. But my sense of it has always been that if you could build the perfect city, if there was such a thing, you would have gentrification because gentrification actually begin, it, it slowly builds the housing stock value and it builds wealth for families that can be handed, can be handed down. The problem is that gentrification can only happen in very small parts of the city and it's it's too intense. I don't know if I'm making sense. Yeah, I know this. where you're going. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, I mean, it's I like, it's like I look at, I look at, um, you know, going back to ta Hesse Coates, right, and, mm -hmm. and yes. reparations yeah. and, and, and the whole thing of, of how he discusses how an entire generation of people in Chicago just simply 
were stymied. They, they, because they were redlined, they couldn't get value out of their houses and they couldn't hand value down to their children. I, I've used this example before. I come from a family where both my parents were just like day workers in factories, right? They, they had no money, they had no resources, but they were able to make enough money that they actually were able to get me through college and they were able to, you know, to actually when they died, I got a little bit of money from them and they had a house. It yeah. wasn't worth much, but I got that house, right? right? This is not an option you have, right. nor is it an option that most of your people, right, if right, I can put it right, that way, yeah. have. So until we can get to that, we just don't even begin to solve this problem. Institutional racism. Right. Income inequality. Right. Yes. So this would be something else that you as mayor, you've got to figure out a way to tackle that. You've got to not only build housing, but it can't just be rental housing. It's got to be housing that people can buy and 30, 40 years from now. Have wealth. They'll have a little bit of wealth yeah. anyway. They'll have something. Right. They'll have something that they own. Yeah. And so what you have is a city that has suppressed communities like Austin, mm -hmm. Inglewood. People have bought houses in the 70s in these neighborhoods and their properties are not worth um, $200,000. Yeah, That's yeah, a problem. Yeah, but yeah. in other communities, the housing stock could be worse, but the neighborhood, your zip code dictates mm -hmm. whether or not yeah. you're going to yeah. get out of poverty. Yeah. If you're black, Mm -hmm. If you're if you're born into poverty, the chances are you're going to remain in poverty until you die, mm -hmm. because the system is set up that way, and mm -hmm. it's not everyday people, white people that um, that we could hold accountable. It's the rich and powerful people that hold all of us down. So yeah. somehow we yeah. have to figure out how we're going to come together as a group. Because lost in this conversation is the fact that there are thousands and thousands of poor white people yes, in that's Chicago struggling. Who, are, who, are, who are suffering from the very same thing. They're living thing. doubled up in houses. Right. They right. move home with their right. parents, you know. Right. Yeah. And we've just become this, this we're, we're getting San Franciscoized. Yeah. We're, we're becoming kind of a city of just two groups of people, Don't wealthy you see? people and not wealthy you, people. You see white people um, sleeping along the Dan mm -hmm. Ryan Expressway. You see yeah. white people under Wacker. You see white people panhandling. Mm -hmm. It's all of us. It's everywhere, yeah. 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 So let's talk about, it, it's such a difficult conversation to have. Let's, let's talk about urban violence, uh, gun violence, and, and the effect that it's having is it's just ripping apart what's left of some of our communities and what we can do about it. Um, th the first place people look, of course, is the police department, and I think that's fair. Yeah. Um, but it's also, as I said, all these other things too. So give me your reaction to the, uh, the, the judge's ruling about a week ago with the three police officers who uh, had been charged with a kind of conspiracy in the way they wrote their reports after the Laquan McDonald uh, shooting, uh, they were acquitted. You know, Ken, that's, that's very telling. And that that's goes from the police patrolling to the police writing up their reports to the prosecutors to the judges. The question is, are they seeing a black man in the same lens as a white man? Yeah. And the answer is no. And so we have to call that out. And so you have a, a black kid that killed um, Idea, sentenced to the years that he was sentenced to, I think 84 years. Something like that, yeah. And he did not intend to kill Idea. It was, he shouldn't have done it. Um, but once again, it's the city of Chicago that um, I would say failed that black youth. Then you have a white cop that intentionally killed um, um, Laquan McDonald because he shot him 16 times and then you had a whole police department that covered up. The value of black people lives have to be equivalent to their counterparts, their brothers and sisters of other races. And until we could have the conversation and make people comfortable with it, we're going to continue to have these type of um, unfair rulings, unfair sentencing, and we're going to continue to have um, white officers shooting um, black men in the back. Mm -hmm. And so we have to have a mayor that's going to say, that's not our city. Our city will not stand for that. We want to have a police department, a justice system, and laws on the books that protects the dignity 
and the humanity of our society. Okay, but with all due respect, those are nice words, this right? True. But you just got elected mayor, and it's your first day, and you're about to have your conversation with your police chief or replace your police chief mm -hmm. or whatever it is that you're going to do. How are you going to begin to make this institutional change in the police department that other mayors have not been able to make? You know, you automatically ask the person that's at the helm of the Chicago Police Department, that's at the helm of the Chicago um, Public Schools, are you going to be a leader that speaks against racism? Are you going to give your department a place to go, a sanctuary place to help root out racism and corruption. You can't have a, a police chief in this city that's not willing to speak. You know, we talk about how um, people are afraid to say certain things. We need a moral leader heading up the Chicago Police Department because the D Department of Justice said that black people are treated worse. And Black people are being killed by the Chicago police, and black people are struggling to have quality education. The question is, are we willing as a society to say, as a white man, hey, that's unfair, and the racism and discrimination in this city is costing me taxes. Because we have to pay police overtime, because we have um, hundreds of millions of dollars of lawsuits, I have to pay more taxes. That's unfair. So together, I think that the mayor will set the tone for healing a city's police department, healing a city um, that is hurting from racism, cronyism, and discrimination. But one of the things that's clearly been identified, and, and I really don't want to just pick on the police for this, but this, this idea of the, you know, the blue wall of silence, the, uh, the, the, the circling the wagons yeah. kind of thing. It happens everywhere. In fact, we saw it yesterday at the Chicago, <laughs> at the Chicago uh, City Council mm -hmm. where all the aldermen started playing the same right. game of like, no, 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 d d don't hurt him. He's, he's, he's a brother, us, you know, right. he's one of us, right? Yeah. So it's, it's easy to criticize, but it's not easy to fix. But in this case, it results in people being killed, it's a little bit different. So, I mean, again, I, I'm I'm sorry if I'm. You're going to give police I, have to have critical race theory just, education. Yeah, I they mean, I need to, to know, know how you can. How you, you, can, can you can do it because in our schools, a lot of our police come from Chicago public schools. Mm -hmm. A lot of our um, police um, are Chicago public schools through city colleges to the um, police force. So our schools should be a place of higher learning. Mm -hmm. And we should deal with racism and discrimination in our schools where people go into these places and they become more knowledgeable and more understanding. Mm -hmm. Our city is, is divided, as you said earlier, is redlined and whites are with whites, blacks are with blacks, and we don't understand one another because we haven't had the, uh, the chance to um, understand our differences. Would you sign and uh, and enthusiastically embrace the consent decree? I, th I think so, but the current consent decree that was just agreed upon still doesn't deal with the fact that there is racism in the department. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of white cops that I know that would like to get rid of the racism in the department, but you know what, there's a code of silence there's a code of silence on the Chicago streets because there's no trust between the police. So people have to have- We all have our codes of silence. That's right, don't we? yeah. And yeah. so, and that's, that's been made up over the years of the machine politics, making sure that they've divided this city and, mm -hmm. and kept us separated. And um, it's, it's been, the machine politics has been the most racist, um, institution in this Chicago. Just think about how they treated Harold. Mm -hmm. The machine politics really treated Harold in a bad way. And um, you know, many people said, and you hear people say, I don't know your position on it, uh, but they say that if Harold had um, still been alive, he would have been, um, he would have done some great things. You I know? believe that. Uh, I, of course, if, I, I'm cynical enough and old enough to believe that um, if the 
if the people who own the city, who have the money, don't want something to happen, it's not going to happen. So, I, you know, I, 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 I tend to uh, kind of look askance sometimes at some of this optimism. I disagree. I'm not sure that you know, you know why I disagree? Because yeah. I think that the city, the mayor has to give the power to the people of the city of Chicago that want to change the city. Right now, the allegiance has to go back to communities. Mm -hmm. If the people know that the power is in every community and that they have the ability to participate in government, then it changes. You have to have a mayor that's going to have communities mm -hmm. behind him yeah, in order yeah. to fight the yeah. big corporations. But right now, you have a mayor that really doesn't care about <laughs> having the community behind him because he's got the money people behind him. Mm -hmm. There's no reason. You look at the at the um, at my um, fundraising, mm -hmm. and you'll see. Compare mine to Daly's. Compare mine to Tony's. Compare mine to yeah, Suzanne, I was I was Chico's. actually just looking at them this morning, yes. and your numbers are not right. <laughs> not very high, to be honest. Don't laugh at my numbers. <laughs> That's because what we're trying to do is change it, yeah. and so we have to make sure that people recognize: Do we want someone that has the um, the alliances with those? people yeah. that have um, held us back. But still in all, Bill Daly has about $4 million more than you yeah, have, yeah, so 4 he's, million. he can afford a few more commercials. He could, you know what he could afford? Those are what you call fake news commercials, uh -huh. because <laughs> you know what? There's, you can't believe anything about those because he controls the narrative. How is he going to get the guns off the street right away? You know, you, you don't need a mayor that's going to be coming into um, Chicago saying, I'm going to get the guns off the street right away. Mm -hmm. um, I, have a plan. I have a plan to do it right away. Well, I've been working on the plan. I'm the chair of the um, firearm task force for the state of Illinois, mm -hmm. and I've been working to make sure that we stop the guns from um, being stolen from the um, freight trains mm -hmm. across the state. I mean, we help usher in new policies for illegal guns and making sure that people have um, uh, sanctuary places for people with mental health problems so that we could take those guns away. So, I mean, you have people with bright ideas, but you also have to look at the track record of what uh, people could do. And being a legislator, I know what we could do, and I know when I hear fairy tales. Yeah. We've had so much discussion about where these guns come from, and of course there's always the discussion about you know, Wisconsin and Indiana and the gun stores that are just, you know, ringing around the edges of the city. Do you believe that, that what, that illegal guns can be curtailed? Yeah, I think that we could um, curtail illegal guns. And what we have to do is deal with the dignity of people mm -hmm. because people that want a, an illegal gun are people that it's criminally um, have criminal minds. Yeah. So we need trade schools, manufacturing schools to catch people before they become criminals in the city of Chicago. So when we have a person in our Chicago public schools and, and they have desires to be a manufacturer, there should be a place in Chicago where they could go. So I'm in grammar school, I graduate from high school or I drop out and now I have no skill. You know, but if I have a place in the city of Chicago where I could graduate from high school, I could go to, to city colleges, or I could go to a trade school, or I could go to the armed services. Mm -hmm. But I have to have a place to go to uh, make sure that my skills are um, improved upon. That's what we're going to do. And then when you have people with hope for a brighter future and skills, then you don't worry so much about people trying to get illegal guns because they're not criminals and they could get a legal gun. And so we force um, these punitive laws on, uh, on, on the books that have to be undone, like the laws for marijuana. Mm -hmm. People have felonies on their records from an early age for marijuana. Now Illinois and Chicago is saying we need to legalize it. But we have had so many people, lives destroyed from simply having marijuana possessions. Mm -hmm. And so now we know that it's been a problem for many, many years having convictions on people's records. So now mm -hmm. we say, let's undo it. Yeah. No, let's just legalize it, not let's undo it. Mm -hmm. 
So those type of laws, Jim Crow laws, are the laws that put us in this predicament where you have people with mental health problems, people that are unemployable, that have felony records, that can't um, find a job, people that have been failed by the Chicago public schools, mm -hmm. that um, dropped out with, without um, a high school diploma, and those are the people with yeah. the illegal guns. This is interesting because, and, and a very important point to make, because you know, I think for too long we've been kind of mixing up the kind of uh, urban street violence, gun violence mm -hmm. that we're suffering here in Chicago, and the kind of generic sort of madman shootings right. that, where people just crack up and go and shoot up a mall or something. They're very different. Their roots are different. One mm -hmm. is a mental health issue, right. and the other, and the other is a collapsing urban environment mm -hmm. issue. And Both of them are mental health. They, well, yes, they're, stress they're, and trauma. Right, they are, that's right. But interestingly, what you seem to be saying, and I and I agree with this, is if you want to get guns off our streets, then start give, then start treating everybody in the city equally yeah. and giving them an equal access to success. Yes, if I have a family and I have a car, mm -hmm. people like having cars. Some right. people will pay a car note. Some people want to have an apartment. Mm -hmm. If I have a job to go to every day, I'm able to enjoy my family. Mm -hmm. I don't want to shoot anybody. Right, right, I right. want to make sure I go to work. And if you own something, if you own a house, yes. if you own that bungalow, yes. then all of a sudden, you're worried about your lawn. That's right. <laughs> you know? And you're worried about kids like messing on your and, lawn. And right? you're saying, you know what, my bills are due, <laughs> and, and you know what, my gas bill is higher, I need to work a little overtime. Right, right. You know, people are yeah. driven into, now there's no excuse for a person to turn to a life of crime, mm -hmm. but we have to know that sometimes in society, not everyone is strong enough to fight it, not mm -hmm. everyone has a strong family to yeah. help them survive, yeah. you know. So we have to make sure that we're fair, as you said. I, I was fascinated when I saw you at one of the forums. It was the one that was on Channel 9, I think it was, and I think you were asked, who's going to be the first person you're going to talk to when you walk into your office on your first day as mayor? And you said, the Lord Jesus the Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, I know that... You know, this is, a, this is something that you have to take from a moral perspective. And, and the city is diverse in its uh, religious beliefs, but you have to make sure that you come from a um, perspective of fairness and justice. No matter what God or whatever you believe in, you, you have some type of moral compass. You contemplated being a priest, I read. Yeah, I was at the um, Niles College Seminary to be a priest. I did a year in oh. the seminary. St. Joseph is now closing mm -hmm. its Chicago um, Seminary, and they're just sending everyone straight to Mundelein now. Mm. And so um, my belief in social justice is my driving force in um, government. And um, I passed a, a um, social justice resolution early in my career in Springfield, um, and I... It's funny because I told Madigan I wanted him to um, support it. And he said, uh, yeah, I'll support it. He said, but your problem will be the Republicans. They're not going to support that. Because when you think of social justice, he thinks that people would think that it's giving people, um, um, you know, public aid. and Giving, giving black their, people giving, money. Right. And so yeah. the people that supported the resolution were the Republicans. Mm -hmm. They all signed in and supported mm -hmm. it because they know that if we make social justice the guiding principles of what we do in government, we at least start off with mm -hmm. a um, moral compass that's good for humanity. Yeah, there, it, this sounds so ridiculously um, naive to say, but I think I've always kind of believed that you could begin to heal the racial divide if an individual, and I think it probably would have to be a black individual, but if someone said, uh, I want to bring justice and, and equality to this city, and I recognize that it has to be equality for all of us, and I need, I, 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 you know, it's like you can't just say, 
I want to bring more resources to the African American community. It doesn't fly. No. But when you say, if we can do these things together, we can actually build a better city. Yeah. And, and that's a message that's very hard to communicate. Because you, you know, people don't want to hear it. But you know, for we have proof that white people want to fight for social justice and want to make sure that there's equality. Mm -hmm. Civil rights movement would not have been mm -hmm. what it was, and we would not have had the success with the civil rights movement without white support. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. We have to go back and recognize and not allow you know, the um, corruption to divide us. There are many people that's willing to fight for equality in this country. And um, it takes all of us to say it because it's a problem that we all suffer from. Yeah. You know, uh, racism, discrimination impacts me personally, but it also impacts you, Ken. Mm -hmm. And so, it does. and so we, I pay for it. you pay for it. Mm -hmm. And so we have to recognize that it's up to us to do this together because it's a, a critical issue that impacts all of our lives and the future generations. Well. I'm afraid we've run out of time here. We could go on for another couple hours here, but uh, you know, this is this was very interesting. I, I'm really glad we got to meet, and um, you know, what can I say? Good I, luck I, to I you. say, brother, let's do it. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right. All right. LaShawn well, Ford is um, the representative of the eighth district, if I recall correctly, in the in the Illinois legislature and he wants to be your next mayor. And um, we'll see how that goes. Let's, uh, let's see what happens. Uh, next week, we think we might have Bob Fioretti, but we're sort of working on our schedules here, so we'll see how it goes. But thank you very much for watching. Remember, you can see all of our past shows by going to this address at chicagonewsroom.org, but you can also um, check out Can TV because if you go to cantv.org, org, you'll be able to see how we're running all of our, our uh, mayoral election tapes all in a row. And uh, it's really interesting to sort of see how they all compare. So thank you very much for watching. We'll be back next week. And you've been watching Chicago Newsroom here on CAN-TV. Thank you much. See you next week.